This is my hot take on the new for 2021 Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch Professional. Hi, welcome back to Not So Obvious Watches. I'm Pete McConville, and this is my hot take on the new for 2021 Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch Professional. Um, there's way too many words in that name. That's really a problem that Omega should address one day about how they've structured their catalog. Way too much nesting required to get to the right watch, but that's a topic for another video. Okay, so this as if you've, unless you've been living under a rock, you will know. And if you've got to my channel, I'm assuming you're into watches. Um, you know that there's a new Omega Speedmaster out. If you've watched any of my videos before, you'll know I'm not a great one for detail and like reference numbers and things. So go check out. If you really want to know exactly what was done from the old watch to the new watch, go check out someone like Hadinki or Fratello. They'll, they'll lead you through that, lead you by the hand through all of that. Broadly speaking, we got a new movement with the Speedmaster Moonwatch Professional Series now moving to a coaxial escapement, which brings with it the Master, Chrono Master Chronometer uh, certification and the whole Metas certification. Um, lots of very small but subtle and significant changes to dial and cases with some doshes, dots and dashes moving around, some of the textures on the dial being messed around with, moving to a, an applied indice here or there, an applied logo here and there, and some minor changes to the case shaping. In 25 words or less, the Omega Speedmaster was coming into this a very handsome watch. It's come out of this update better in every way. It looks a little bit better. It works a little bit better. It's more accurate, more, mag more anti-magnetic. It's just a better watch. And from that point of view, if you liked, a, if you liked um, a Speedmaster before this, you're going to like the one that comes out of it. There you go. <laughs> That's about all I need to say on this update. Um, and I could just end the video there, but you know, that's really not going to be much fun. So let's keep talking. If you are more interested in some of the details of the changes, some places I'd suggest you go would be Fratello's website and or YouTube. Um, I'll put a link to that. Um, Hadinki's website and or their um, their new their most recent podcast. They've done a, an excellent discussion about this this release. And a small channel that did a really interesting take, not just on changes from the old version of the Moonwatch to the new version, but also how the limited editions that have been coming along in the middle of that process have kind of pointed the way to where we're going. Really good video on Charles Lusso's channel. There will be a link in the show notes. And if if you can't find her, if I forget to do it, just search on Charles Lusso. Excellent video. And yeah, really recommend you go check it out. So as I said, I've pretty much covered from my point of view, everything that changed with the watch. Kind of like when the new Submariner and the new Oyster Perpetuals came out though. I think what's really interesting is not necessarily the changes to the watch, because as we've discussed, they're kind of small and incremental, but rather the changes around this release, the discussion around this release. And I think what's really important about this new Speedmaster isn't necessarily the changes to this watch, but rather what the changes to this watch signify. And in this particular case, more than anything, what the talk around those changes signifies. Generally, that talk has covered off on three broad topics. The first is, this seems to have ignited a lot of discussion on Omega versus Rolex, and whether Omega, how they're different, and whether Omega can reclaim its throne from Rolex. The second big issue that's come up is the question of icons. What is an icon and how should they be treated by brands as they do updates? 
And the third big discussion has been around pricing. Those three issues, Rolex versus Omega, how we update uh, icons, and how this watch is priced, have really been the three big topics I've seen going around um, this watch release. And in some ways, they're all tightly related. So as I walk through those topics, what you'll see is that they all kind of bounce off each other. So talking about the Omega versus Rolex talk that's come up, that's probably inevitable. Um, about six months ago, uh, Rolex updated its most significant watch, that is the Submariner. And the Submariner itself is probably the most significant dive watch in the industry. And to have Omega now update its most significant watch, the, the Speedmaster, which itself is probably the most significant chronograph in the industry. And given that Rolex is clearly the number one most important brand in the world and Omega is probably number two, the, the, the context is such that number one, number two discussion is inevitable. And remember, you might, if you haven't seen a, a previous video, I was talking about things I had seen develop through 2021, or th sorry, through 2020. One of them was a real weariness with what's going on with Rolex, with all the talk and all the all the argy bargy and discussion that goes on about wait lists and preferred customers and availability and flipping and 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 that's come to the fore. This watch, this release, has brought all of that to the fore once again. And in ev in just about every discussion about this new Seamaster, or sorry, Speedmaster there has been an immediate response of how refreshing it is that we're actually going to be able to buy this. That even upon release, we're already seeing them turn up in shops, be available for purchase, having them turn up on Instagram. And how that was contrasted with all the bullshit that's going on with trying to get hold of a new Submariner and how no one seems to be, there seem to be lots for sale on the grey market, but no one seems to see them. You don't seem to see them on anyone's actual wrist on Instagram or anything like this. And it's, like I said, this release has really shone a light on the disparate ways that Rolex and Omega look at us as you know enthusiasts how they how one seems to treat us or treat yeah i'll use us broadly even though i'm not likely to be a customer of either of them how one seems to treat us almost with disdain whilst the other goes out of its way to give us what we want one holds on to its product and only releasing it when it suits them and the other does everything within its power to make sure we can get what we want from them and that's really come, as I said, that's really come to the fore and been highlighted by this release. And pretty much every big podcast that I've listened to, that has been a major theme. Moving on to the second one, the role of icons. And this touches on the previous discussion as well. There's been a lot of discussion about the fact that this, these changes I mentioned, new movement, um, some slight changes to uh, dial layout, slight changes to case shaping, slight upgrades to, to bracelets, are all iterative. They're all relatively minor changes. Some of them actually go back in time rather than go forward. They go back to old displays, old case shapes. Um, and generally there has been universal praise and acceptance of that. I think that just as much like there was when the Rolex, Sub Rolex Submariner was updated, there's been a widespread acceptance, actually happiness, that Omega didn't mess with their icon here too much, that they have stayed true to what it means to be an Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch professional. I always forget the order of those words. Um, what has come up, and again, this is again touching on the Rolex versus Omega thing. Some there has been a little bit of discussion about why hasn't Omega copped the same kind of eye rolling that and the, and side eye side eyeing that Rolex did with the Submariner. Um, 
People have noted that, but I don't think there's been a lot of discussion about why they are different. For me, I think it's relatively easy. Yes, for these watches, those upgrades were both incremental. The, the changes Rolex made to the Submariner, minor updates to an existing template that can't be messed with too much, and exactly the same thing was done with the Speedmaster. The difference is that's all that ever happens to any Rolex. The, the entire Rolex catalogue is treated as though each and every watch was an icon, and no watch is given the opportunity to shine and change and evolve. That's fundamentally different to what happens over at Omega. Yes, the Speedmaster Moonwatch Professional is kind of revered and put up on a pedestal, um, but everything else is pretty much allowed to move around. We're constantly seeing different takes on different watches. We're constantly seeing potentially brand new types of watches come up, such as the Aquaterra World Timer, or we're seeing really fun plays with existing watches, like the, the Speedmaster Snoopies. So I think whilst the changes that each company made in this case um, with this watch or these watches were relatively minor, they're made in very different contexts, which is why um, I think Omega has sort of their reverence has been respected, whereas Rolex's gets a bit of an eye roll. Um, but anyway, that's sort of the second point on the treatment of icons. The third and probably the biggest issue I've seen kicking around has been a discussion around price and whether the new Omega, which has got more expensive, has earned that price increase. Now, the first thing is, this just made me laugh. It makes me laugh all the time whenever we get into these discussions. The reason why it makes me laugh is this hobby, watch collecting, is the most consumerist hobby you could ever imagine. It's a hobby that really makes sense and it exists within this kind of capitalist, consumerist, money-driven um, context. And yet, as soon as we have to put our hands in our pockets and spend our own money, we all turn into Marxists. And what I mean by that is at this point, when we have to look at a price, we all start applying the Marxist labor theory of value, that the price, that the value of a, a good is somehow can be determined objectively from the materials that are in it by what it does and how much work was put into making it. The truth is, if we were to embrace the capitalist side of us that all of us do, we'd all be talking like the Austrians and going to a subjective theory of value and saying simply, hey, look, if someone bought it, it was worth it. Um, <laughs> there's no idea, there's no concept of how much work or what it does or what material went in. All that matters is someone bought it. And it's what's interesting. And as I say, I constantly laugh that all of these very very fiscally conservative right-wing people that tend to be in this hobby all become Marxists when they have to spend their own cash. But anyway, we'll put that to one side because I'm kind of one of them. I, I do. I, I, we, I can understand, I can put my thinking rational hat on and talk about homo economists and become an Austrian and use the subjective theory of value. But the truth is normal humans actually think more like Marxists. We want to see some value. We want to understand that there was some work done to, if not, not justify the price, then at least explain the price. Now, the good news is, after that big long ramble that may or may not even stay in the video, um, the good news is I think that the price increase of the uh, the new um, Speedmaster can definitely be, can certainly be both justified and I think explained, and I'll try and do both. So before we go on, what has the price increase been? Okay, so if we talk about there's eventually, essentially two versions, I'll simplify them down to the Sapphire version and the Hesalite version. Uh, the Sapphire version has increased in price from 63.50 US to 71.50 US, and the Hesalite version has gone from 53.50 US to 6300 US. So basically, the Sapphire version's increased in price by about 800 US, and the um, Hesalite version's increased by 
about 950 US. I think I've got those numbers right. If I didn't, blame Hadinki because I stole it from their website. So the first point is, can we, the first way of looking at this is, can we justify, is there value, if you like, in the updates which would justify spending an extra eight to $900 on these watches? I think there is, frankly. Um, the first is you obviously get the new coaxial movement. So higher tech, newer tech, uh, more accurate, more anti-magnetic, more robust. All in all, those are worth something to you. They also come with a much higher level of quality control. So it, you know, the Rolex boys have been explaining the price of Rolex um, by citing the amount of quality control they get for a long time. Well, now Omega's in the same place because that's what Metas is. It doesn't make the watch any better, but it makes it imposes a level of quality control such that you are much more likely to get what you wanted. So it's much more testing to make sure it's as accurate as you think it's going to be. Much more testing to ensure that you will absolutely get the water resistance. You will absolutely get the robustness. You will absolutely get the anti-magnetism that you thought you would get. And that's done on each and every watch, and importantly, not on the movements, but on the watch itself, the whole thing, ready to come to you. So that doesn't come cheap. Uh, now, the, I know that the early, when it was first implemented, the whole Meta certification thing, um, Omega was prepared to eat the cost on that. I think it's reasonable that at some point they expect to actually start charging, charging us um, based on the costs of things. That Metas um, quality control process is expensive and we're going to start paying for it at some point and that point seems to be now. Now that's how I think you could, if you like, justify the updates. If you don't think that that's entirely valid, if you still want some kind of explanation of some of the other changes, I think that's pretty easy to see as well. Year in, year out, Omega up, ups its prices by between 1%, 2% on a, on a good year for us, bad year for them, and up to about 7% on a good year for them, bad year for us. So if you consider that there's a couple of percentage points of just routine price up, pricing up, that's explainable. I think you'd also, I suspect we're going to see lower volumes of watches being sold. Um, and as in ever since I came into this hobby and have been watching Swatch uh, press releases and financial reports, they have said each and every year I've looked that they want to constrict, constrict distribution. They want to get on top of the, the gray market. They want to get rid of this dumping discounting with COVID, with the new watch, with a new release, with everything that's going on in the world, there is to be no better time to get on top of that. Now, I don't for an instant, not for one second, do I think Omega is going to play any Rolex style games with waiting lists or anything. So don't. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is they're probably going to go more to a Tudor model where... Look, you might have to order a watch or there might be two or three watches available for you at the dealer at any given time, but there won't be hundreds of watches at Chronext or Joma Shop or anything like that. They'll be much, they won't be rare, but at the same time, the market won't be flooding. And what that means is all of that R&D, all of that engineering that had to get done in the update is now going to be spread across less watches, which means the increase on those watches will be higher. The next thing I'd say is there's going to be a bit of COVID catch up um, as things that were um, costs that were incurred, income that was deferred, a whole bunch of things which happened as a result of COVID. Um, are going to have to be paid for at some point. And a new watch with a new movement, a whole bunch of updates is a perfectly good opportunity to claw back some of that lost revenue from 2020. And the last thing I would say to sort of justify the price is the price of this watch now, the Omega uh, Speedmaster Moonwatch Professional, definitely is right in the ballpark of where a watch like this would expect to be. What I mean by that is if you look at what, it's, what are the natural competitors of an iconic and important chronograph from a mid-tier luxury company? Well, the obvious ones would be the Breitling Navitimer, the uh, Hoya Monaco, and the 
Zenith El Primero. Those are kind of like the head-to-head -head competitors with this. Horologically important watches with largely unbroken histories, mid-tier kind of um, luxury performance, that kind of, you know, we, we expect to sell thousands of them, but at the same time, they are of good machine-made quality. That's your competitor. Now, if you look at the, those prices, you end up saying, well, the the Hewitt, the Hoyer comes in the cheapest at 6300 US, noting it's only on a band. The Zenith comes in as the most expensive, also only on a band at 8400 with the Navitimer and the Speedmaster kind of just in the middle. The Speedmaster at the low end at 7100 ish and the Navitimer is slightly higher than that at about 7800 Now, all of those prices are kind of approximate because they depend on what your tax rates are and what your... Um, what's going on with currency on any given day. But in short, the Speedmaster, if you look at it like against its competitors, is kind of in the ballpark. Actually, if anything, kind of down the cheaper end. Now, those are against, if you like, its most natural competitors. Horologically significant and important chronographs, which have got some kind of, if you like, significance that way. If you compare it to the other obvious competitor, which is less horologically significant but is a huge style icon and that is the rolex daytona it's a bargain i mean on a technical level on a on a performance level these watches you know go toe to toe on a fit and finishing level the daytona is probably better but is it double the price better i mean you're looking at the again the, the moon watch is going to set you back something like 7,100 US and the steel Daytona, if you can get one, is going to cost you $13,500. Now, I, there's every pot, like I said, technically, bang, you know, as I go down the spec list, not a great deal of difference. I'll credit the Daytona potentially, not having had them side by side. I'll give it the, the win and say it's probably better finished. But is it so much better finished? Is it worth so much more? Again, I think when you look at the price, forget whether the Omega has gone up against what it was. If you look at the price of the Omega versus kind of where it sits in the market, its natural competitors, it's somewhere between good value and great value. So I really don't think the pricing, even though it has gone up and a lot of people are getting funny about it, I think it can be justified, explained, and makes perfect sense for where it sits in the market. So in summary, what, how would I sum up everything I've just said? One, I think this the new Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch Professional is a stunningly effective update. This came in as a good looking watch and it's left as a better looking watch. It's come in as a really well performing watch and it's left as an even better performing watch. It's come in as an icon with lots of ideas about how it should look and how it should work and all of those have been respected and built upon and moved it forward. This update does edge the, the Omega price up a little but still keeps it very much in the affordable luxury, the accessible luxury place. It's going to be available to everyone um, at every AD and there won't be all the bullshit that comes with getting some other watches like the Daytona. So all of that's going to do wonders for Omega. And it does take all of those things and it does kind of lay a groundwork for Omega to really push into Rolex territory, to make a push to reclaim its throne if that's what it even wants to do, if that's even something Swatch wants Omega to do, which I'm not sure they do, but that's going to be my next video about Omega. Should they become the new king? Could they become the new king? And if they were, how would that happen? But that's my next video, not this one. This was just talking about the Speedmaster, which I think is a fantastic update. Um, and... Yeah, that's really about it. If you've got ideas, if you've got comments on anything I raised today, leave them below. I'll see you later. I've been Pete McConville. This has been Not So Obvious Watches. Bye.